Hey guys, what's up? This is with the Tech, and this is the iPhone 13 Pro Max, Apple's latest and greatest, and also biggest, iPhone in the story of iPhone. And this is my review and thoughts on it after using it for some time. Let's check it out. Since we always start with design, this part will run a little quicker than usual. For the most part, the shape and design for the iPhone 13 is pretty similar to the iPhone 12. It still has the industrial design, stainless steel flat edges, and the front display is still a flat panel, so there's no curve off there. There are two new things that stand out, however the extra large cameras on the back and the smaller notch on top of the display. Over on the front end, the display is a 6.7 inch LTPO display. We do get a little bit more of screen real estate back thanks to the smaller notch cutout, but in terms of UI, we don't really get much back because we still don't have the battery percentage number in the upper right corner. The camera bump is larger than its predecessor and is actually noticeably large as well. Due to the massive increase of the size of the camera lenses and the bump, last year's cases don't work with this year's iPhone which could be inconvenient for those who want to snag a cheaper case. However, chances are, if you're a person upgrading from the 12 to 13, which I do not personally recommend, pricing probably wasn't gonna be an issue. The front display looks a bit more modern with the implementation of a smaller notch, as we mentioned earlier, and this is accomplished by smashing in the earpiece right between the edge of the phone and the notch. Apple has notoriously always had the largest notch in the market, and although this is a step in the right direction, it still is a larger chomp of our display compared to other competitors in Android land. But to the the vast majority of people, the notch isn't an issue honestly and you get used to it. The color we have here is Sierra Blue, which is pretty much baby blue. Now looking at I.O. and buttons, we have the same old school lightning port and the same placement of power on one side and volume on the other. Of course, as per usual, there is no headphone jack. Okay, now let's move into the realm of cameras now. This is an area that is guaranteed to always get an upgrade, no matter how iterative of an iPhone upgrade it is, come rain or shine. The iPhone 13 Pro Max's cameras are probably the best on any smartphone at the moment, even if they are quite iterative compared to the iPhone 12. The iPhone 13, when supplied with great shooting conditions, obviously takes great pictures with lots of detail. But where the 13 really improves upon this year is that it can now take on challenging shots and low light shots with a little more grace than usual. There's more detail captured in and the softness is a little edged out. Every single lens here in the camera system gets an overall upgrade by getting a larger aperture as well as being able to take in more light. The one that probably had the largest glow up is the ultra wide. The telephoto can now zoom in 3x as opposed to 2.5, a minor improvement there. We'll just have to wait until Apple adopts a periscope zoom lens as with the rest of the market, but it's still a nice upgrade nonetheless. Still, with these overall improvements with the sensor as well as the ability to take in more light, Apple's more conservative approach here when it comes to megapixels is a letdown in some regard. I absolutely respect and commend the position of Apple for choosing quality over quantity, but it's time to move those numbers up a little bit. When talking to other people who take cameras much more seriously than I do, one of the issues of iPhone photography is that you can't blow it up or pinch in to zoom without losing quite a bit of detail. Another cool neat trick introduced in this year's iPhone is the introduction of macro photography. I didn't care too much about it on Android phones, and truthfully, I still don't care about it on iPhones that much either. It's fun to play with for a day or two, but I seldom go back just for it. Now, two of the larger things that Apple introduced this year on the 13 Pro series of phones are software-based. The first one is known as Picture Profiles. Picture Profiles in the rough and dirty are basically like filters. Now, how they actually work is a lot more complicated than that. In order to make it a little more understandable in layman terms, what it does is that it actually changes the way how the camera via the sensor interprets exposure, white balance, color, and contrast in the computational photography pipeline. Unlike a filter, Picture Profiles doesn't put something on top of the image post-processing, but it actually changes the way how it processes the image. Rich contrast chases the Google Pixel look, while Vibrant makes it much more Samsung-like. I personally like rich contrast more, and Apple even allows you to set these as your new default shooting styles. Plus, you can customize them to fit whatever you like. In terms of video performance, the iPhone still holds the crown for the best video captured on a smartphone. Videos captured at 4K 60fps still look amazing, and they even look good on a computer at full screen. No one here even comes close, and with the promise of ProRes coming over the horizon, it looks like Apple is just going to take a lap on the competition. While we're on the topic of video, let's talk about the second big thing that Apple showed off for its camera app. That's the introduction of cinematic mode. Now, cinematic mode can also be described as being the portrait mode to video. Here is how the video looks on the front end. We're gonna use this to compare against the cinematic mode. And here's how cinematic mode, see how it clips in my hair there, right there. On a side note, there are lots of options in the camera app now and it's getting kind of cluttered out there. 
I really hope they find a way to clean it up or at least let us get rid of things we don't use. Now let's run through the specs and then daily usage after that. The iPhone 13 Pro Max comes shipped with the A15 Bionic processor, a 1284x2778P LTPO display that adjusts its refresh rate up to 120Hz, 6GB of RAM, 128GB of storage for this model, a 12MP main shooter, ultra wide, and telephoto capable of 3x optical zoom, only Bluetooth 5 support, Wi Fi 6, 5G ultra wideband, and a millimeter wave in select markets, and finally, a larger 4352 milliamp hour battery. That's a larger increase compared to the 12. In terms of performance, I wasn't really complaining about the lack of performance from Apple's latest and greatest. I trust that they're going to be great. And if you're a 12 user upgrading 13, you're not going to notice it. But the main people here are going to be upgrading, the vast majority of people, are going to be those who have an older handset. Apple keeps offering these iterative upgrade cycles because you want to have the best of the best when it's time to upgrade. The A15 Bionic, paired with 6 gigs of RAM, is the bee's knees. It handled everything I could throw at it, plus it maintained those apps in the background as I went to sleep and I woke up to them ready to go again. And if you needed just one more argument into why you should care about Apple having a faster processor in their phone, is that when you have a faster CPU, CPU, a faster processor, right? You can do mundane or complicated tasks much faster. Well, with that spare time now, you can put that towards bettering your life, spending time with your children, making the earth a better place. And really, that's the gist of it all right there. These faster iPhones means you're a better person. Apple's really doing this for the children. Now, in terms of daily usage, let's talk about what I usually do. I read a lot of news, lots of tabs, things in the background. I scroll through lots of social media apps, the one that are like infinite scrolling. I watch the occasional video here and there, as well as take pictures when out and about. I don't really do too much gaming, so that's not really in my daily usage, but it's, I trust I could probably could game well on it. Now, all those things I've listed were massively benefited from the three key areas that Apple improved upon this year. That was the camera, the display, as well as battery life. Now, we already talked about the camera, so we're gonna talk about display and battery life. Having a screen that refreshes at 120 hertz refresh rate, it makes mundane tasks feel a lot snappier and smoother. There are gonna be a lot of people who don't even realize what 120 hertz refresh rate is if they've only used iPhones, and they're gonna honestly just say that this snappier experience is just because the phone is faster. And it doesn't really matter if you know what it's called as long as you can feel the improvement. And although Apple is late to the party here, it's still nice that these phones do have 120 hertz. Now what's really gonna be great is when they offer this to the lower end phones as well. Watching video content on this is pretty sweet thanks to the higher sustained brightness of 1000 nits as well as the peak brightness of 1200 nits, I believe, for HDR10 support. Where I really saw the benefits of having a brighter display was actually for outdoor usage. iPhones have typically fared not so well against competitors such as Samsung in terms of outdoor usage because these phones just didn't get bright enough. But for the first time, this is an iPhone I use where outdoor usage was no problem. I could have used this perfectly in direct sunlight. And although it's not as bright as Samsung phones are, right? It does fare enough. Eventually, I expect it to get brighter with future upgrades down the year of the iPhone 14 or 15, etc. But right now, this is good. Not great but good. Now onto the area of battery life. This is a spot that Apple fans and consumers have always been asking them to do much better in. And surprisingly, the iPhone 12, the last year's iPhone, they actually gave us smaller batteries. So the 13 removes that by giving us a much larger one, giving us net more battery than what we lost. This translates really well into real life performance because I saw around two or one and a half day battery life consistently. And when I did have those heavier days where I'm using Google Maps a lot, and I am managing my brightness personally, I saw myself around having a good day of battery life, although I still had to charge at night. For 5G support, millimeter wave is still only available just in US models, but for all phones sold elsewhere, you still get ultra wideband support. And what I can say from my end is that I could find 5G much better in my area now, but I'm still opting to use LTE because I'm still seeing much better battery life overall in terms of using LTE versus 5G. The bigger batteries means 5G is now an option, but I'm just actively choosing not to use it. Now, those three areas that Apple improved massively on translates really well into daily usage. These are things you can actually feel, use, and see. It makes you wonder why Apple didn't implement this earlier, especially the 120 hertz refresh rate, right? Because Android's had them for a much longer time and the smaller notch because let's face it, this is still an outdated design, albeit a much better outdated design compared to last year's version. But even of all that said, it's here now and that's why the iPhone 13 is almost the perfect phone. Keyword, almost. Let's talk about the things I didn't like. First up is in the charging department. Charging speeds for this phone is 
a lot slower than I'd like. Now it is true, Apple is taking a much more conservative route here, especially compared to its uh, to the Samsung's, Oppo's, OnePlus's of the world, right, with their warp charge technology. But even with Apple's own fast charge at 20 watts, it still takes a little longer than I'd like. And that 20 watts, charging brick doesn't come in your box anymore. You have to buy it separately. There's a good chance you might just have a five watt charger and this thing takes forever to charge on that. Also, while we're talking about charging, now let's talk about wireless charging, MagSafe. The MagSafe ecosystem still hasn't panned out. I think the way Apple has anticipated or I myself has anticipated as well. One of the big issues of MagSafe for me especially is that any official Apple MagSafe certified thingy just isn't strong enough. You have to go to third party accessories in order to get a good, strong, grippy magnet, something that really gives you a good amount of force and stays onto there. And without that, I just don't trust MagSafe enough to hold my phone on like a car dash, right? Or to put a wallet on the back of it. I'm afraid it's gonna fall off. As long as that fear is there, I'm not gonna buy Apple's first party or official third party partners. I'm gonna get stronger magnets from who knows where, and that's just the risk that consumers and myself have to take. Now on the cameras front, there are two things I'm gonna complain about. The first one is that they really do need to upgrade the megapixel counts on these things, not to the stratospheric 100 megapixels that Androids have to use and then bend them down, but to something respectable, like maybe 18, 20, or 25 megapixels, because these look great on your phone. But if you wanna blow them up, if you wanna crop in in order to get a better frame shot, you do lose a lot of detail. Also increasing the megapixel count will make this more of a pro phone too, because now you can start seriously considering this over a camera since you can blow it up and print it out. The next area is in terms of UI. I don't like it how when I go to the camera app, there are so many options to choose from now. I got time-lapse, slow-mo, cinematic, video, photo, portrait, pano. And then not only on top of that, the UI kind of sucks too now when Apple's camera app used to be some of the best. I have to press this little arrow on the very top to see my other fine options, or if I don't press that, I have to swipe up in order to access, again, more settings. This is something that isn't really too intuitive, and I think it's gonna be difficult for Apple to do, but it's something they're gonna have to figure out. And the highest list of complaints I have, especially this year, is that this iPhone marks another year where Apple excludes USB-C, and they just have plain old lightning. This is going to be frictionally worse this year because with the implementation of ProRes coming soon over the horizon, those file sizes are gonna get much larger. And piping that through USB 2 speed cables to your Mac or PC is gonna take forever. While USB-C, if it's 3.1 or 3.2 Gen 1 support, could be five gigabytes up and down. Lacking the ability to transfer large files quickly makes his phone, although named Pro, not very pro at all. I understand and get the reasons that Apple has for sticking with Lightning as opposed to USB-C. I just don't agree with them and I don't accept them at all. And you shouldn't either. However, with all those gripes I have, those are offset by very real, although iterative, good changes. Yes, the iPhone Pro Max has its issues, but it has one of the most complete packages of getting everything you want a smartphone onto one device. A lot of the things I named, you can honestly overlook. If you're a lifelong Lightning user, so you've only used iPhones, USB-C isn't that much of a problem, honestly. Even if all your other devices are using USB-C, at least you don't have to change cables. And for my issue of photos, well, most people see their photos on their phone anyways or on someone else's phone via social media. So the issue of fine detail, that's kind of marginal at best. The iPhone 13 Pro Max is a really great phone with real shortcomings. But to most people, those shortcomings are either minor or none at all. If you have an iPhone that's a XS or older, this is a great phone to upgrade to. And if you're a person that's balling and you have a 12 and you want to get a 13, it's, it's a nice battery upgrade, but there are some areas that you can learn just to wait out for. Because one thing is guaranteed, every year there's a new iPhone, and every new iPhone brings some kind of iterative, minor change, and sometimes there's a big change. But right now, this is one of those minor changes. Even if the notch did get smaller and there's a LTPO 120 hertz refresh screen, if you had a 60 hertz display screen, you probably could live with it for another year or two. The iPhone is a very dependent phone, although somewhat restrictive. But if you can learn to live with that, this is a phone that's gonna serve you well and you'll probably be happy using it. This is what the tech, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.
No, I do not want to enable dictation. 